is it going live? Is it? It is live. Okay, we're gonna put. If it's Tuesday, that means it's time for the Comic Book School live show, because at Comic Book School, we own a Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, April 12th, and it's very difficult to do this. That's not what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to see you, and I'm glad that you're there, and I can see you uh, right through the lens of this camera. And I got to tell you, you know what? If you're a first-time creator hoping to get your first exposure into comics publishing, a rising talent building your audience, or an old grizzled pro like me, we welcome you to Comic Book School, where we talk about the craft and business of making comics. My name is Buddy Scalera. I'm the founder of Comic Book School, a place where people can go to learn about the craft and business of making comics. I think I repeated that. i got to rewrite that. I'm also a comic book writer and a publisher with nearly 30 years of experience in the comic book business, and I am joined by legendary three-time Emmy award-winning writer and the guy that used to sit next to me at Wizard. Please welcome Mike the Solo. Yay! So, there you go. I mean, you're you're here again. You, you have a weird backlighting tonight, Mike. Yeah, I know. It's, it's very bright out here in sunny California. And you know what else is bright tonight, Mike? Our show. Oh, well, isn't it every week? We certainly do have a big show. We are going to have uh, two count them two top-notch writers on the show and that doesn't count you and me which would make it four <laughs> at a certain point but um you know the show itself um has grown to legendary proportions in my mind and it looks like oh oh mike i'm sorry did you disappoint they think you have a golden robe on mike oh no tonight's not the golden i had the robe on earlier but uh we had to have some work done on my on my uh, fountain so I couldn't walk around outside with it on. So on I your fountain? Off. Yeah, we have a fountain outside. Hmm. The motor broke. That's so we had to get a new motor. My fountain. <laughs> that's how you live in. That's how you live in at large. <laughs> yeah. Oh, change it now. It's the golden hoodie. Yeah, maybe next week for the robe. Maybe next. You know, week. I like to keep it. Uh, keep it crazy. You never know what's going to happen. Well, speaking of crazy, we actually have an opportunity to use a graphic that I uh, I rarely use. We actually have today a pop-in pop guest. guest. Yay, we have a pop-in pop in guest. Um, our pop-in guest uh, previously appeared on the show. Let's we'll see if I could do this. It's ne There's never going to be a good way to do this, is there? Just finding those buttons. Yeah, I I froze it on this frame. I've got my I've got my fist the cuffs up, and she has a, a rather freaked out expression on her face. Um, but um, I want to welcome back uh, to the show Stephanie Cook. Hi, thank you for having me back. Thank you for that lovely introduction of my terrified face. Love it. Uh, I had to can only get better thing. from here. Hopefully, <laughs> you know what? It does get better because we talked about the first in uh, a series of graphic novels that you were working on, and apparently, you have some news. You want to give us that news? Yeah. So the second one, oh, it just came out, and look, look at, at that. that. I have it right here. So um, it just came out last week. Uh, Oh, look, here's the first one. Uh, uh, that's the first one that came out that I was talking to you all about last time. And uh, oh my gods, too, The Forgotten Maze has arrived. So uh, I'm very happy for this book baby to be out in the world. Stephanie, I, I could not be happier for you. I, I, ha I happen to think the work that you're doing is just so wonderful. And it's great that a publisher recognizes your talents and your hard work and uh, you're building your audience. Where can people go to find out about the new uh, book? Yeah, you can go to ohmygods.org and that'll take you to the website with all of my publisher information and it'll give you a wide variety of choices on where you could pick it up and you can learn a little bit more about it. But if you like Greek mythology, if you like puns and uh, in my opinion, very delightful dad jokes, it's, gonna be up your alley so 
Well, we, we congratulate you and hope that you sell out. And uh, apparently you have a very important uh, meeting directly after this one that we can't hold you up from. Where are you going, where are you going now? I am off to go do another live stream, but I'm off to far off worlds where uh, I'm going to go play D and D. So, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With the Going Critical crew, so I'm off to go that do that. Well, Good thanks luck. for coming back, Stephanie, to uh, talk about your book. I hope you come on for a full episode again. Can we get you to come back and maybe talk a little bit about the process again? Anytime, I would love to. You know, I love to talk. I would be more than thrilled. Except and on D and D night. Who, who don't know, you can go find uh, Stephanie's episode uh, at the Comic Book School channel where uh, some of you were tuned in on Facebook, but those of you will find it on YouTube. So thanks again, Stephanie, for joining us. Thank you for having me. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye now. Bye. Well, that was fun, right? Yeah. I want to hear more yeah, about nice. our D&D crew. Yeah, we, we, had, a, we had a return uh, group. Mary Ann just checking in. She's, uh, she's just giving us uh, support and peace and uh, pencils to everyone. Pencils. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So people are people are all saying hi to each other in the chat room, Mike. We're uh we're 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 just secondary to that <laughs> part of the conversation. Yeah, um it starts out with the robe and then it goes downhill from there. Wow. So Mike, I am super excited. Our next guest is uh somebody that I've I've read her credits for many, many years, and uh I didn't really know her, but I kind of knew of her. And then this year uh, this year, no, uh, last year, she came and joined us at New York Comic Con and hosted a panel. Uh, her name is Elisa Quitney, and she's a writer uh, who has written uh, many novels, um, many comics, and is here to talk a little bit about her new upcoming comic book, uh, Guilt. Please welcome Elisa Quitney. Yay! Hey. Hey. So, Elisa, welcome to the show. It, it you know, it's uh, it's really great to have you. Um, I actually did my homework, and I think, Mike, you did your homework. We actually read your comic in advance. We actually prepared for this show. Yes, which is, nice. which is amazing. For both of us. <laughs> but isn't it strange? Like, you can want, I mean, this, I'm speaking for myself. I can want to read something desperately. And suddenly when I know I have to read it to be prepared for something, my inner 12-year-old is like, just put it off. Just put a little mm. a love boat right now. Maybe you should check the news. And I, it just, it, it transforms it. My house is never cleaner than when I'm on a deadline. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's never cleaner. In fact, one of the reasons the area behind me is, is so neat is because I had to read your comic book to prepare for the show. But I did do it, Elisa. And uh, I didn't even have to go back in time to do it. I did it here in real time. Mike, that's a back in time reference and this is the genre that you love that I hate. Go ahead, tell them, Mike. Yes, time travel. Huge fan of anything that has to do with time travel. So your comic is a is a good thing for me. I was very excited about reading it. Okay, so now I'm really curious to know why what you love about time travel just as a trope or is it a genre or a trope? I think I think it I would be a, a genre, I would guess. Maybe. Um I just I like the whole aspect of of being able to go back and forth in time. That's one of the one of the things I would do if I had a superpower. <laughs> you just do you have like a like a time bracket, Mike, that you'd want to go back and forth in? Is it just a couple of days? Is it a couple of years? Probably that ten minutes. I'd like to go ten minutes back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> that seems very. That seems that seems rather useless. If if what what would you do with that? You could do anything with it. You make a mistake. Uh, you know, you go, you fix it. You got ten minutes to fix it. I, you look 10 minutes would, into the future? Yeah. I think that would actually be sort of the definition of a rut. But now, okay, buddy, so you don't love this as a genre or a trope. No. But what is it in <laughs> general? Not not my comic, but what is it in general that turns you off to time travel? Because everybody does the same thing. Let's go back in time and kill Hitler. Oh, let's go back and re-meet that girl that we didn't meet when when the elevator doors were closing. Was that sliding doors or something? And I always think like, oh, come on. Like you I wouldn't just, you wouldn't go I'm, back in time and change anything. You'd be like, eh, it's fine. Mike, I can't be trusted to change anything important. <laughs> okay. Well, so just if you had the option to though. So I just want to say that the very first thing that I thought about in terms of time travel was how hard it is to change things in the present. 
I mean, yeah. like every day I wake up and I'm like, I'm not going to futz around today. Today is the day that I'm not going to randomly start looking at things you can do with breadcrumbs. I, you know, I'm just, I'm going to stay focused on the work I need to do. And I'm going to get in a Pilates workout and I can't make it happen. Now think how much harder it would be to change <laughs> something in the past where your influences are completely different. So I, I would say that I think it would be so hard to kill Hitler because, you know, Hitler would be like this cute little baby and you'd be, it would be this whole other. Would he have that mustache in the, in the crib? <laughs> you think? In the crib. Do you know why he had the mustache? I actually found out. This is there is a real, really there's a reason? He had a, he had a mole. That he covered no, no, no. Up. Okay, so um, the the big the big what do you call them uh, mustaches were in before World War One. Handlebar mustaches. Handlebar, and then they went into the the World War, and they all had to wear gas masks, which didn't adhere over like now we've all seen with masks. You got to trim your facial hair, and so they would trim the sides of the mustache so that they could fit it in the gas mask. She learned this on a deadline, Mike. She, that is, she that's had to some turn good knowledge. something in. And I'm the queen of trivia that sometimes works its way into stories, but uh, yeah. It's good to uh, know. We got a proper name. It's called, they were called mutton chops. No, the mutton chops were just the ones that came down. The mustache is the one that they used to, you know, the old timey villains used to twirl. Yeah. And it all came back in the 70s and now we kind of have the the twirly thing. I wore one of those one time for for one of the Emmy parties. I was like, oh, yeah. you did, Mike. You uh, you you've had quite a few looks. Let me just see. Yes, you, I you, do. Here, you're you're where there you go. <laughs> There's Mike at the breakfast table with his end. What did you call that cut, Mike? Uh, that's the Wolverine. <laughs> you did that on purpose. I did that on purpose. I wish I had the. I'm gonna have to send you a picture of the the real handlebar one that I had grown out. It was nice. So, at least, are you going to maybe do the handlebar as well? Uh, I'm still plucking at this point, but you never know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Elisa actually joined uh, me, Mike. I, I had never actually met her in person, although I, I have strange suspicions that I met her at some point at, in the 90s uh, in the comic world. But I... That's my next comic. We go back 90s? in time. Go back in time. When did I meet Buddy? That's the, yeah. that's the question, right? You could go back and change that. See, that's an easy thing to change. But he will have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I tried. Mike knows. I've tried very Anytime. hard. Anyway, Elisa, a lot of people from comic book school saw Elisa. She uh, came to the New York Comic Con. And hold on. Let me see if I can do this a little better. Covering my mustache with the mask. No, hold on. Let's see if this, this is better. Push, there you push go. The button. There you um, go. So Elisa came and we went through one of her scripts. I think it was, Myst was it Mystic You? It was Mystic You. Mm -hmm. It was Mystic You. We went through a Mystic You script uh, and she uh, dropped knowledge and education on the group. And she had uh, multiple artists uh, drawing her work. We showed her work and, uh, and it was great. She was a terrific guest. Oh, thank you. So Elisa, I'm gonna I'm gonna bio her a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna bio her a bit. I'm gonna show that uh, Elisa has uh, written uh, many comic books. This is off of her own website. Um, I actually have the one that drops below the fold here with the Vertigo Visions, uh, which uh, which I love, which is an art book. I have that. Um, lots of novels and books, and most recently uh, published a book called Rogue Untouched, uh, doing a Marvel novel. So she is pretty much all over the place. But I will note, I, I am also a proud owner of uh, Phantom Stranger, uh, I, which I always thought was very underrated. I thought you did a terrific job with that. But uh, that's who Elisa is, Mike. That's excellent. I've never written a comic book. I can't believe that, Mike. I'm a little stunned. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Well, you know, it's, it's not too late. All you have to do is start by watching videos about breadcrumbs. And put their mustaches, <laughs> and then you and then clean the house. Wanting to yeah. go to a Pilates class and just not doing it. <laughs> so, Mike, I am going to be pulling up. I, I'll, I'll never get this right. Where I, where I literally, you know, I'm always done. You would, you would think me. that during the week that you would try to arrange it so it would be easier. No, it's Tuesday. just so hard to. Eat. It's a, it's a locked <laughs> interface. I can't change it. 
I'm sorry, Elisa. <laughs> I'm um, just gonna get over looking at my face reversed. Like I, I guess it's not reversed, but I'm used to seeing myself reversed. So I'm trying not to stare at myself. Well, it's gonna get weird for a minute because I'm gonna ask you okay. to tell us about your comic book, and now you are the biggest, most dominant image on the screen. I am reversed. The face. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, I, I have my Endora for security. Okay, I put down my Endora. Um, so here's here's guilt. And here's alternate. So I have, oh, you've even better. Now I have no face. I have just covers. So that is the amazing Jill Thompson, um, Alain Morisset. I just had an argument with my artist. My artist and I have been uh, trying to collaborate for seven years. And I've been saying his name wrong. And he's never corrected me. And I think at, at a previous show, they're like, it's Morisset or Morisset. And I'm like, it's Morisset. Which it turns out it would only be if he were female. So... <laughs> I'm not talking to him anymore. Um, but anyway, okay, the comic. So I I ended up, my shorthand for this comic was it's the Golden Girls meets Sex in the City by way of the Twilight Zone. And um, and then I, I think at one point the publicity guy for Ahoy, who's wonderful, said, Can can you think of something else? Another way to describe it. And I said, Okay, it's Rosemary's baby. <laughs> If Rosemary and the baby and the whole Satan thing are not involved, but you got the spooky building and Ruth Gordon's elderly, you know, feisty, witchy character, plus Lara Louise, who plays the middle-aged uh, neighbor, who's always going around with the Ruth Gordon character. You know, it doesn't make it any clearer, but I will tell you, Mike, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I read the first issue. I thought it was terrific. Uh, Lisa, I did too. And, yeah, it was, yeah, it's, and, a, good, and it's a, a good setup. Yeah. I, do you need to set it up a little more more coherently? Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going. You were generous enough to share with us um, your pitch uh, to Ahoy Comics, um, and I, I zoomed in in a couple of areas. And since this is an educational show, ostensibly, well, I should say what it became first before you guys see what the pitch was, because it did change a great deal. Okay. So I, I will just say, okay, so Hildy is a woman in her 70s. She's living in the Upper West Side in an apartment in a, a building that has some unique properties. It was designed by theosophists and occultists. And, um, and Hildy is trying to, I, I guess there's no point in concealing it. She's trying to go out her back door, which will allow her to go back in time. And she's going to go back. And she's going to relive a certain day. And she gets one chance. This isn't Russian doll or Groundhog Day. Basically, you go back, you, you go out the back door and you're sucked into the body and the person that you were. Your consciousness now inhabits your older body. And time is passing in the past. So once you know, you've been through November 30th, 1973, again, you're not going back there again. You get one shot at it. And so she wants to go back and really change the past, but she's been having a lot of trouble changing the past because um, partially because of the way the past works and partially because of the co-op board rules. And along comes Trista, who is her new and unwanted home health care aide. And Trista has no intention of working very hard. She belongs to, I call it the Bill Murray School of Employees, where she's just trying to do the bare minimum and make it through. But one thing leads to another, and these two women end up uh, going on an adventure together. She's good at pitching, isn't she, Mike? Yes, I would buy I, that comic. Yeah, as I'm listening, I'm like, hey, I'm really listening. Oh, <laughs> you. Well, and I just want to say that Tom Pyre accepted this when it was not this coherent, like, this is what I'm writing. Um, but, you know, you well, you'll see with the pitch that it, it was a bit different to begin with. It, it, it is, um, it's very charming. Uh, we're going to show a little bit of the artwork. Um, let me show you, just, to, just so people can get a hint of it. it and, and we know from experience with Ahoy that they do like um, stuff to have a hook of humor in it, Mike. So this definitely has a, a, a really strong hook of humor. Um, and the educational portion, um, we're going to look at Elisa's first, uh, your, in a nutshell, uh, pitch. And, and I think you mentioned the Sex and the City. You want to just 
take us through this and um, closer. oh god it's gonna be monster face again i i saw another clip of me and it's like my face was one inch in the screen but that's what i'm gonna need to read this um okay yeah so um so in the beginning, in the first iteration, you can see that Hildy, who ends up being in her 70s, is in her 50s. And so originally, I knew that there was um, going to be this whole, let me go back and say this differently. In both Sex in the City, the original Sex in the City, and in The Golden Girls, spoiler alert, <laughs> the first series ends when one of the characters gets married. Like that's the happy ending. And I thought, oh, that's wrong. You don't want these friendships. I mean, the Golden Girls, Dorothy leaves not only her friends, but her mother. The hell? So this is not what you want. To have. You want them to always be hopeful for love, but you want them to stay together. So initially, I thought my focus was going to be on Hildy and the friends she left to get married. And I thought, OK. Um, see, this is the good thing. I've got, I'm sitting on an exercise ball chair, and so I can like scoot in and out and bounce up and down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> so that was what I thought initially was going to be the focus. It was all going to be on Hildy and her friends, and I kept figuring out that dynamic. Um, eventually, when I realized that even though Hildy's trying to get back with her friends there was going to be this uh, dynamic with Trista, um, the, the home health care aide, that changed things a bit. So then Trista became the one who was middle-aged and Hildy became older. And then there was one more thing that I had to figure out before it actually started working. So what is important to note, and I think the, the key takeaway that I'd like to drive home for the, for the students uh, who are learning uh, is that, yeah, you, you know, you can start off with an initial idea um, and then it evolves. And and I, I would imagine that your initial concept evolved with Tom, um, Elisa? Yeah. So, I mean, part of it was me trying to figure out, I knew time travel, I knew older women, I knew the Golden Girls, Sex in the City, but I couldn't quite figure out how it was going to work and what the dynamic was going to be. And even after, I mean, I look back at my old things and I'm like, oh my God, it was so different. And I think that I didn't realize how much it was gonna be a two-hander. It became, you know, it became very much about the two women as, as, as dual protagonists. And I don't think I knew that for a while. What is a two-hander? That, that means- a two -hander, <laughs> Oh, a two-hander is when you've got two protagonists. Have you ever heard that, Mike? Oh yeah, all the time. That's that's one of the uh, industry terms, two-hander. Is it really an industry term, or are you just saying that? No, I'm just saying that. Has anybody else heard of a two-hander, or did you just make that up? I I didn't. I don't know. I read a lot of. Here's the thing. I read a lot of books about like Billy Wilder and Ernst Lubitsch, and maybe this is a term that was like used a lot in the '50s. So I I, I the old two-hander. The old two-hander. Alisa <laughs> has a, a a stunning hold of pop culture, especially older pop culture. I I listened to her on I have show. pop culture by the anyway. Sorry. She she is unbelievable. I heard her go toe to toe with this. This other and the guy just tapped out. He just couldn't keep up with Lisa. I, you know, and I know people who just, you know, wipe the floor with me. So it's um, there's always someone better than you at knowing, you know, obscure pop culture things. Mike, why are you muted? What did you, what did you do? Because my muted? dogs are barking. Really? You haven't yeah. gotten rid of them yet? Oh no, not yet. But oh, I'm, I'm planning it. If I could go back in time, I would not like get them. The best bit on, on pop culture, people wiping the floor with her and you tap out. Well, I, I didn't want to jump in on the two-hander. If, if, his, if his dogs start barking, what happened on a different show is um, th their dog started barking and then mine started barking. So it became, <laughs> it became a two-hander. It is a two-hander. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so the writer has spoken. So... What we're going to do is uh, I'm going to jump to the bottom of your proposal, Elisa, because I think it was really important. Um, what the hell did you, I say? You actually noted for Tom what the appeal of this particular story is. 
Uh, can you just talk about what, actually, uh, before I do that, let, let's, let's start from the top. So from the top, you give them the, the nutshell. And I'm not going to make you go through all of this. You, you outline the story, mm-hmm. right? And, and you, you break it down. You, you really spend a lot of time on showing the setup and why people would be interested in reading this. Mm-hmm. Then you continue on. it. It's, it's fairly long. Um, but I think at this point, you already have a relationship with Tom Pyre. He's already welcomed the proposal. And then uh, at, the, uh, at the end, um, you, you show the imperative. And then finally, eventually, you, you, you give the, the appeal. Where's the appeal? I lost the appeal, Mike. It's at the bottom. Oh, here's the appeal. That was the final, yeah. the final element. The first one you put up. Now, Elisa, one of the things that's important for people to note, and I did mention it at some point, Mike, um, she's also an editor. Oh, look at this. The, 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 the audience is... <laughs> Apparently it is a thing. I looked it up. It's a thing. Also, Bill likes your ball. <laughs> and Ruth, uh, who is, who is a, uh, is, uh, is our, is our fill-in, uh, host, uh, to play, to hand or a play for two actors. Wow. Look at this. Issue number one, buddy's time travel. There's no <laughs> way. I will not write time travel. So, Lisa, I forgot to mention it, 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 it and it is a very significant uh, part of your career. You were an editor at DC Comics. You want to just uh, briefly talk about what you learned as an editor at DC Comics about writing a pitch uh, for an editor, because I think that's a really important aspect that, that our students would love to know about. You know, I'm going to be really honest here. I, I'm at an age where I forget everything constantly. And so I don't remember what I learned back then. What I'm always trying to do is is find some, I'm either imitating the last pitch I did, or sometimes when I, I've forgotten what I did, I have a friend who's really good at pitches. And I say, could you send me one of your pitches again? And then I use hers and I kind of jump off from that. But for me, as I think for a lot of writers, the pitch is me trying to pretend that I know what I'm doing. (laughs) And the truth is I don't. So when I looked at that um, pitch, what I realized is a lot of the things that I included in the pitch became backstory. But in this comic, it's really interesting. I don't want to do too many spoilers, but in the pitch, there was this whole thing on how Hildy inherited the apartment. And the way it was framed in the pitch, which I'd forgotten, is like, this was going to happen now. So Hildy's in her 50s and um, and an elderly neighbor dies and and one thing and the other happens. She inherits this apartment. Um, That changes a bit. But because I'd worked it out so much, that all became backstory. And um, and the way things worked in this comic is that all the backstory kind of ended up connecting in in all these weird ways so that, you know, you discover that um, I, I, I keep saying there are no coincidences in time travel. And um, and so everything kind of fit back in. So while I was writing that, I think my subconscious was busy taking notes, but um but I didn't know exactly how everything was going to fit together. And I think, uh, I think this is true of a lot of writers. So I'll tell a story about Rogue and then I'll go back to being an editor. I just want to tell you guys this because it's, I, Marvel wants like a Hollywood uh, outline. So I had to do this really full outline with who's my villain, who are my characters, every beat. And then like they, yeah, at one point they said, you don't have enough third act beats. So I went back and wow. I showed it. And then came the pandemic and I'm working on it. And so many things happened. And when I finally turned it in, um, the editor was like, Lisa, this is a problem. Now, no editor has ever said that to me. And it's because I had deviated so much from the outline. In fact, I brought in an entirely different villain. <laughs> Um, and she was like, this, I don't, they're not going to allow this. And I said, it's going to be fine. I was <laughs> Just put it through. <laughs> and so I, I wrote a letter to <laughs> this unknown Marvel editor. I had two editors and said, you know, this is why I chose this other obscure character to be my supervillain. Um, and they did accept it. But after that, I began to think about how many writers, like it, things often do change between pitch and comic. 
And I, I know that I can't be alone in this. And often, you know, even my outlines, I'll sort of work on something and then I'll reshape the outline as I'm, I'm going along. As an editor, I found that I was asking what we were all supposed to ask for. You know, I was, I was an editor for Vertigo. Before that, I was an assistant editor. And, you know, you, you would ask, okay, I would like to get this approved. Tell me, you know, what are you going to do with this character? And who else are you going to bring in? And let's get the right, you know. So as an editor, I know that you have to ask for these things. And as a writer, I know that, you know, the answers are often complete BS. <laughs> As in Buddy Sclera? Exactly. <laughs> it's weird. As in a two-hander. As in a two-hander. Actually, Ruth continues to uh, to work on this for you. Uh, huh? She noticed it's also a, a tennis term. That's I want Ruth to focus. Yeah. yeah, I want Ruth to focus on the show, and she's 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 in Wikipedia right now. <laughs> she's, she's Googling two-hander. Yeah, she's... Suddenly, she's like looking up Godzilla movies. and Wait till I start talking about the Lubitsch touch. The oh Lubitsch boy. touch. Wow. I mean, do we need to switch it to channels? I think we're supposed to be rated PG. <laughs> well, um, the Lubitsch touch. Actually, I've been like doing this deep dive into Billy Wilder. And the Lubitsch touch is uh, Ernst Lubitsch was one of the great early uh, directors and writers, and he always had very clever visual ways of very economically uh, giving you information in a way where the, the audience had to connect the dots. Hmm. The Lubitsch the touch. The Lubitsch touch. The Lubitsch touch. Wow. That's interesting. Mike, we learned, well, we learned something all we the time. We learned two things. Two things. Today. That was two, about the Hitler that was, mustache. Uh, that's part, by the way, that is part of my process as a writer is I find for fun, I'll read um, scripts often of movies that I've really liked, like Billy Wilder's The Apartment. And that's just sort of how I start my my writing day. Sometimes. So people wanted like Batman and Spider-Man today and they are they are getting the Lubitsch touch. <laughs> you know, it's like Lubitsch is like the Alex Toth of of co comic of movies i don't know what if what if lubitsch gave a two-handed touch two-hander touch that he would he, that would just that's be too lubed mike that's the two lube <laughs> that's touch, the lube touch. That's two lube a, touch that is and and so we're gonna get back to comic books mike because we don't want to get canceled so elisa um and yet in your own way um were you able to pull off the rogue uh switcheroo i mean what? Yes, because I mean, so part of. Do you want me to talk a little about this? I'll tell you. I'm, why. I'm fascinated by by you pitching one thing, outlining something else, and then turning in a completely different manuscript and getting away with it. Getting away with it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't everything else. Okay, the original villain who is in the book was the pig, and um, the, what? The, pig. the pig. Yeah, the pig is a character. Um, is it Gambit? Um, Gambit's the pig. The no, pig? Gambit. Gambit has an enemy called the pig. He does. Yeah. This is this is news to me. This is. Um, He's got is... The, the crazy eyes. Oh, Hans Lubitsch. Wow. Oh yeah, I'm saying Ernst. Oh, sorry, it was Hans. God. Yeah, that's his brother. That's why they had the two-handed. <laughs> Ernst. I don't know why Ernst feels like the right thing. That was the other Bolian sister. That was the other Lubitsch brother. Okay. <laughs> Back to the, so the pig was this villain and I liked he was just like big and uh, porcine and, you know, and anyway, but as I was writing him and I thought about how he had been drawn and I always like to pick obscure characters that not a lot of, has been done with. So I have some room to play. And I realized that he was, you know, in a sense, not human looking and um and didn't seem to have any real powers. And then I thought about how everybody else was sort of human looking. And I thought about the, the real world analog of this, like, oh, what are we saying? Only, you know, attractive people can be good. Um, the way the pig had been drawn, uh, he was incredibly top heavy and I didn't think he could support his weight on his tiny little legs. So would that mean he needed hand crutches? And just the more I thought about it, the more, you know, I spoke to uh, my friend Al Davison, who's a comic book creator, and I just thought, mm, 
as written, I can see problems because, you know, when you're writing a novel, it's, it's like this whole world. So I thought I need a different big bad. I need to do like a switcheroo where the pig looks like the villain, but there's somebody behind him or above him. And so I thought, let me pick somebody really obscure. And I found this wonderfully obscure character um, she was this very powerful, almost immortal character, very blonde, very beautiful. And I decided, it all comes back to the love boat, I decided to write her as if she were Ginger Rogers appearing on the love boat. So Ginger Rogers, like a lot of old Hollywood stars, appeared on the love boat in the 1970s, and they were already really decrepit. So they kind of come on and they were all like corseted. And it's like Ginger Rogers had been this amazing dancer, but by this time it's like, oh, you know, and she's moving like this. <laughs> So I, I thought I could have so much fun with this. I, if this character is, you know, nearly immortal, let me make her like really old, but wanting to rejuvenate herself. And it just seemed more fun. There were anyway, more so the, pig, the pig was the character that you pitched. Yes. And accepted and, and then signed a contract and took an advance, right? This is, I'm trying, I'm tracking the business elements of this too. <laughs> and then when you started typing, you went, ah, that's right. I have a better idea. So... <laughs> So well, at any point, do you let your editor do you let your editor know, hey, what whatever editor's name is, you know, Ernst Lubitsch. <laughs> it um it it is actually Ernst. Uh, Ruth uh, has uh, summarily fallen on her sword, and, and acknowledged. Thank you. Right, there okay. you go. And Vince, I don't know, he's doing an Abbott and Costello you routine. You filed the wrong thing. Sorry. Sorry. That's <laughs> See, that's a whole time travel thing. His name could have been Hans, but then somebody went back and changed it to him. So, Elisa, is it true that the quality of the work, and I, now I'm going to put you on the spot, and I, you're not egotistical, but it's the quality of the work that carried through the change to make it acceptable. Like, if you basically crapped the bed, they would have been like, rewrite this with the pig. Okay, so, well, I think it was two things. Um, I... And again, I, I'm going to be frank, like all kidding aside for a second. Everyone's pandemic was different. I had some <clears throat> family craziness uh, during the pandemic that made it really hard to write on time. So I was also late, which I have not been in that way for anything else. Um, and I think I was not as organized with it because, you know, it's, you, you know, some people were living with their kids um in you know and things were a little crazy i had my my uh, mom who was having her difficulties living with me and uh so i just want to be a little frank that this was not my ideal way of working and it wasn't as coherent as it might have been in in normal times um but two things now i i do think i did manage to not you know crap the bed uh <laughs> I've never used that term, certainly not with people watching, but okay. Um, but I think more than that, it, it, there is enough of the editor in me to know what I could get away with and what I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I did some due diligence and I picked a character so obscure that no one was doing anything with her. And I looked at the character and I thought, how likely is it that the Marvel movie people are saying, hmm, this obscure blonde immortal character who hasn't done very much is going to be the star of our next movie. And so I, you know, I knew enough about where they might pick someone, you know, because that's when you really can't mess around with a character mm -hmm. when they're doing something with them for TV or movies, when some big name person is rehabilitating them. I managed to find someone pretty obscure. No, I don't. I, did you name the character? What's the character in the Rogue book? The character I've now forgotten. <laughs> I have to look it up again. Who the hell was it? Uh, Rich, Rich asked if it was Belladonna. No, she's in there too, but she's not the one. Um, God, she's. You know, this is it. I'm. I'm losing my. She's. She's got a name. Is it? It's not. Clarice. Nice. Clarice. Chandra. Is it Chandra? Chandra. Oh, wait. What I'd like to think is, is that Elisa made this a memorable character. Yeah. Well, here's here's my Which question you for you. When what? didn't you have to turn in like pages or anything so they could read them and say, okay, it's going well, or did they just no, get, no, go did. off on your she, own? I did. They didn't ask me for them, but I did send them in periodically. They just weren't the one. Clearly, that, they I never read them. 
Well, I think they did. They they just read. I mean, the pig is in there. The pig oh, is in. There. So you tricked um, them. I did. It's just Act Three where everything became, you know, a bit of an insane. Um, I I forgot the name of this movie, but I watched a like a really old movie which starts out being kind of a sexy farce and then ends up on a dirigible where people start to do an electricity dance and then the dirigible catches fire and it becomes this completely different thing. Sounds and like I a thought, yeah, dream. that's what I aspire to writing. <laughs> Sounds like a fever dream. <laughs> I got to read this rogue book now to find out. Yeah, all I got to read the rogue book too. Belladonna uh, Ruth redeeming herself maybe. here. Uh, Pig was created by Fabian and Steve Scroach. Yeah. It's Chandra of the Floating Spires, is it? Oh, yes. The Floating Spire Chandra. And uh -huh. and, and apparently people can't let go of the whole Ernst <laughs> Pond thing. This Chandra. one. Uh, Elisa. Chandra. Sorry, Chandra. And um, oh, the other thing is I, I gave Pig a name. I thought I can't call him the Pig. Can and nothing be Pig? Isn't that yeah. his name? Well, <laughs> His name was just the pig. He had no other name. So I gave him a name, Gongora. Bongora? Gongora. Gongora. Do you have to say it with that vaguely Romanian accent? Is that... <laughs> what is it with you and my accents? I'll be talking like this now. Alisa, when I speak with her on the phone, it is like this. And she goes through accents. And, and, and I'm, I'm literally certain time writing things down. And I'm not, I'm not good at accents. I remember, you know, when I was working on The Sandman, sometimes I would try and do what Neil Gaiman called my pirate accent. Go ahead, show us your was, pirate accent. I don't remember. It was probably my attempt at doing some British accents. <laughs> <laughs> Why does everybody do pirates as R? That's all they ever say. Arr. That's all they ever said? Matey, yeah. rawr. Arr, matey, you landlubber. But, Elisa, I think it, it is also worth noting uh, that your connection to Sandman uh, has also uh, created a new thing that you're on. I know you're on temporary hiatus, but uh, why don't you tell them about your podcast? Where I do accents. In fact, really, for some reason, like on the last one before hiatus, I started to go into an Irish accent for Season of Mists. I was doing the Clurican, and I regret that now because now I've listened to it. Um, I, I have to hold in Dora again. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so um, Lonnie Diane Rich, who is a wonderful writer, story expert, has written this great book. She and I together are doing uh, Endless, a Sandman podcast, where she reads and responds to Sandman, the comic, for the first time. And I, um, you know, reminisce about uh, the olden days. And now we're on hiatus, um, and I, I think... Um, we, we may come back and do some more episodes. We may have some guests on, um, where, uh, but then we're going to come back and, uh, and start uh, commenting on the Netflix show when it comes out. And that's a, where can people get that podcast? Uh, so it's, um, it's uh, Endless, a Sandman podcast. I think it's on various things. It's a transistor, but I think you can access it through um, a whole bunch of different, different uh, things, can't you? Spotify. I am the bad person at trying to. Um, I know if I just go to my podcast app and I put it in, it pops up. So presumably others can do the same. Was it was it uh, was it strange going back to work that you had worked on? I, I Sandman was 90s, wasn't it? It was time travel. I mean, it really, there were times when I would start looking at a script or looking at artwork and having these weird flashes. It's like going, you know, if you, if you haven't traveled someplace, have you ever had this experience? You know, let's say you went to, I don't know, Amsterdam when you were 20 and you don't go there until many years later. When you go back, it feels like no time has passed because the last time you were in that place, you were much younger. And so... It, it has been a very time travel -y experience. Yeah, that's a good answer. I like that. And it, it ties it together. Now, one of your bona fides is, uh, is something that you told me once offhandedly uh, that you discovered a creator and a series that eventually uh, became a hugely successful Vertigo series and, uh, and a television show that I love. Tell them what you discovered and how you discovered it. Um, I, I guess it's not a what, it's a, it's a him, Mike Carey, right? Yep. So Mike Carey, 
Uh, one of the things that we were encouraged to do as editors was to read through the slush pile and see if we could find any talent that we would like to develop. And um, I remember reading something by this guy, Mike Carey, and thinking, ooh, this is interesting. And I started to talk to Mike, who's one of just the loveliest, smartest people you've ever met. And um, and we started to, to uh, you know, put him together for Lucifer, which was going to be a spinoff of, of Sandman. Um, the truth is that I realized around at a certain point, I realized that I needed to to make some choices. I was editing part time, writing part time, and I had two small kids and I just couldn't do it all. So I, I decided to focus on the writing and the momming. And uh, and so I I left Mike and Lucifer sort of they were about to come together and Shelley um, then Roberg now Bond was um, you know took over and just was an amazing uh, editor of that book but I've just watched Mike's career you know he did also uh, the girl with all the gifts um, he did the um, the Felix oh God. Um, what are those wonderful um, necromancer exorcism books that he did? Felix Castor. Mm. Um, he's written just as Mr. Carey and as Mike Carey. Just everything he's done is incredible, and I, you know, you could just binge read him for the rest of your days and be happy. <laughs> well, I encourage people to binge read you, Elisa. You have. Uh, quite the body of work. Let's just uh, take them through the quick tour. Uh, lots of comics, um, lots of books to choose from. And then, of course, uh, coming very, very soon uh, is uh, Guilt, which uh, we have people check this issues. out. Yeah, the first issue's out. First issue's out. Oh, okay. That's very good to know. And we're excited for you. We think this is going to be uh, good, even though it's time travel. <laughs> oh, that'll make it even better, bud. Come on. Even God, I can use travel. that as my pull quote. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's good even though it's time travel. So, Elisa, um, two questions. One question we ask every guest, and the other uh, is just where they can find you. So we ask every guest, um, what is one piece of advice that you wish you had received early in your career? Oh, gosh. Um I received a good piece of advice that I had trouble letting in. So my father was the science fiction writer, Robert Sheckley. And I remember I was 19 and I, I, he didn't raise me. So I was sort of getting to know him and I showed him my writing and I said, do I have it, you know? And he said, you know, you have talent for whatever that's worth. I'm like, well, if it's, if it's not worth anything, what is worth something? It's like, well, just sitting your ass down and writing every day. And um, and I thought that that was the most unsatisfying bit of advice um, <laughs> at 19. At age 30, I thought, you know, that probably wasn't bad advice. And now that I am in my 50s, I think oh, that was brilliant advice um, because it's, it's really about doing it. But the piece of advice that I wish someone had given me is write for a reader, write for a reader. Imagine if you yourself were walking into a comic book store and what would you want to read? Not what you wanna write, what you would wanna read. And be honest, like I'm a little ADD, I get very impatient. And so I keep trying to rewrite things so it's quicker. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, um, that's something I have to learn. I think that's great. That's a, that's a great piece of advice, both. From your father, uh, just sit your ass down and write. <laughs> and the other is is obviously write something you'd want to read. And, and Elisa, where can they find you if they want to follow your ongoing adventures? Oh, let's see. Well, I'm um, I, I'm on Twitter at uh, a at a Quitney. I'm right now. My Instagram is just embarrassing because the only thing I've posted is K Witty are my uh, feeble attempts at drawing, which I do on Thursday nights uh, with this online visual arts passage class. Uh, so what else, what else? Um, Endless, uh, a Sandman podcast. And uh, and I've got a website, uh, www.alisaquitney.com. 
Um, I'm on Facebook, but uh, I think I, 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 something happened to my author page. I have to like revive it because it, 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 now it's hiding in some crevasse. But yes, those are other places you can find me. Come find me. They will find you. Uh, you just got a shout out from Rich. Miss Quitney, you are great and don't look a day over 40. Thank you for sharing everything uh, you have with us. There you go. You got you earned a new fan. It's you started the with a fan, and now Excellent. you have Excellent. Excellent. And right before I came on, I actually uh, called up my my friend who used to do makeup. I'm like, how's my face look? She's like, do this to your eye, your eyelid. Yeah. <laughs> don't <laughs> let them reverse your face. <laughs> Whatever you do. <laughs> Well, Elisa, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we are uh, going to put you into the green room where uh, I hope you stay until we close out the show. And uh, as we always say, there's always snacks back there. So thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on guilt. We look forward to uh, talking with you again in the future. Thanks. Well, that was great. That was a great interview. Yes. Yeah. She's got a lot of I, uh, I, I've been trying to get her on for a while. I'm, a, I am, a, I'm personally a big fan. I'm, a, I'm the assistant to the treasurer of her fan club. Nice. I have yeah. to go through her page and see all the books because they sound interesting, especially that rogue one about the pig and everything. Else. I, and I, and <laughs> only because my stuff is all packed away still from the move. Um, I, I do have that art book that she wrote which I thought was great. Um, you know, look at this. People are, people are really digging Elisa. I, she's in, at least if you're in the green room, you, you can see that the people are giving you the, giving you the love. They're giving you the love and I'm not even paying them. This is all free. So Mike, even though I hate time travel, I, I'll pull it up again. Cause I can see her leaning forward to see her, her, her accolades. Cause I can see her. She can't see uh, she, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, even though I don't like time travel, and I would sometimes go as far as to call it ridiculous as a genre, How dare I you? will read Elisa's. Will okay. you? I will read. Yes, I was. You know, it's time travel. Of course, I'm going to read it. <laughs> it's time travel. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, Mike, I have to tell you, I write for you. Uh, I do. You're my first audience. I really. I, yeah. You know, you. I. Huh. I really do. Is that why I you do. haven't written anything in such a long time? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, Lisa's not even gone to see Bill's comment, but she'll see it on the replay. I agree, Bill. She's she is awesome, and she did a great job. So, um, I'm going to put you in the green room. Um, but thanks again for joining me, Mike, and uh, helping to make this fun. Happy to be here, bud. And thank you for joining. Uh, this time with you is my favorite time of the week. Uh, I really do look forward to this and to uh, spending time with you. Your comments uh, help keep Mike and me charged up. And thank you so much for making our guests feel welcome. Uh, I think Elisa Quitney is proof that you just have to sit down and do the work. And if you look at her body of work, you'll realize that she does put in the hard work. And let's face it, you know, she did pivot a little bit during her story, even though she plotted, uh, she pantsed a little bit too, which was to say, the story took her where the story needed to take her. And you should think about that as a lesson. Um, replay this video and take a look at the script that I popped up on the screen, not the script, rather the pitch. Use that pitch as inspiration. That pitch, even though she was an experienced writer, still had to be a great pitch. And you still have to write great pitches so that you get that opportunity to write great stories. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys again next week. Uh, we have some additional guests planned. Um, I don't remember who they are, but I'm sure they're very good. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. I'm Buddy Scalera, and for Comic Book School, uh, keep creating comics. Uh -huh.